So um, what I'm just going to recap um, today is some of the research that's been uh, happening or is about to happen in relation to uh, winter grazing. But as uh, we've heard from both Tom and Olivia, as part of that winter management plan is having that adverse weather contingency plan or some of you may um, know it as your plan B. So it's really important in those um, plans that we're considering uh, the welfare of the animals, uh, the environment and people and safety in that um, contingency plan. One of the questions we got last year when we were asked, um, when we we're talking about contingency plans was, well, how do I know when to implement my plan? So uh, can I have the next slide, please, Maria? What we did at the Southern Dairy Hub last year is we uh, ran uh, some monitoring in an experiment for a month through June and July. And what we were trying to do was um, link cow behaviour and soil conditions to come up with some, some practical visuals linking those soil conditions to lying behaviour. So we had 120 uh, animals enrolled in the study and we had two um, mobs on fodder beet and two on kale. And we used some different devices. So we used um, an accelerometer around down the bottom of the um, cow's leg to tell us whether she was standing um, or lying down. And then we had um, ear tags, cow manager tags that gave us an indication of activity, uh, ruminating and eating time. And then what we did, um, the team went out and did a whole lot of soil measurements looking at pugging depth and um, wetness and a whole lot of a whole range of things and so I'll just go through briefly some of the results for what we found from that next slide thanks Maria so one of the we looked uh, as I said we had fodder beet and kale paddocks we didn't um, in this study observe any differences in the soil conditions um, between fodder beet and kale paddocks so you can see the uh, in terms of pugging depth, um, very similar, um, similar percentages of um, dry, wet and sodden and also the percentage of pooling. What we did observe uh, from this study was it was actually the paddock location that was more important than the crop type. So at the Southern Dairy Hub we have um, lower lower flats which um, are heavier soils so we uh, were seeing differences, they were um, not holding up as well as our upper terrace. So it's more the actual paddock rather than the crop that's in the paddock that, that affected the soil conditions. Thanks, Maria. So what happened in terms of um, lying time and in relation to the weather? And so on this uh, slide here, we've got a couple of graphs. So the, the top graph uh, is the days of study. The blue bars are rainfall. So you can see on day 17, um, we had a 12 mil rainfall event. And that resulted in um, a reduction in the lying time uh, across of um, all of the animals. So we'd been sitting around that eight to 10 um, hours. So on the day of rain, uh, it dropped to about six. And then the day after it dropped even further because we had follow up rain from that. So um, we had a decrease on the day of rain and the day after, but it rebounded two days later. And that, I guess, was indicating that um, when the conditions um, came right, those cows were tired and so they were spending longer lying. So on rainy days, they had fewer and shorter lying bouts, but when they were in that recovery phase, they actually had longer lying bouts. Thanks, Maria. So what we were able to do from the study was look at um, the individual animals. And so for uh, cattle the recommendation is at least eight hours a day of lying and so that's the bottom line in the graph and you can see um, averaging over the 30 days of the study we had a group of animals um, with, in the red circle that were below that eight hours uh, and then at the other end we had a group um, in the green circle that were um, lying averaging lying times above 12 hours so we were able to go back and look and see who was in each of those groups and what we um, identified was that in that at-risk group, it was our younger, earlier calving cows. So they were calving eight to 10 days earlier and had an average age of 3.8 years. So they're predominantly three and four year olds. Whereas the ones that were had the longer lying times had an average age of seven years. What we don't know is whether, um, is 
is what's driving that. So is it the older animals are the more dominant ones, and so they're getting the feed first and then finding those good lying spots? Or is it that um, because they're older and um, maybe a little more tired, that once they lie down, they lie down for longer? So that's something that we need to look into. But I guess it gives some indications in terms of the, the class of animals within your mobs that you need to be watching out for. Thanks, Maria. So in terms of um, our visual um, indicators, what we uh, observed was that a ruler to measure pugging depth, gumboot score and water pooling were all really good measures to estimate the true mud depth and the paddock wetness. So um, the gumboot score, for those that you are not um, familiar with it, it's um, used a lot in off paddock systems, but basically if when you walk across the paddock, you can still see your um, boot print once you've gone, um, then that was given a dry score. Um, if it was, um, once you lifted your foot, it was a little bit sloppy, that was wet. And if you either left your gum boot behind or your footprint completely disappeared, um, that was given a sodden score. So um, pretty simple to do as we're going through um, our paddocks. Thanks, Maria. So as I said, we did measure a lot of different things um, and there was lots of um, interacting factors, as you can see um, in this diagram here, that were impacting the lying time. But uh, surface pooling from the, the results was the most useful. And of course, this is strongly linked um, to rainfall and will also be affected by soil types. So if you've got um, a more free draining soil, then you won't get surface pooling as quickly as you will uh, on a heavier soil for the same amount of rainfall. But being able to assess that surface pooling um, is a really good indicator in terms of whether animals are achieving their lying time or not. Thank you. Next slide. Yep. Oh, next slide. Yep, thank you. Um, so I guess getting back to the, the purpose of the study in terms of what are those indicators for indicating uh, for implementing your contingency plan. Well, clearly the amount of rainfall and the number of consecutive days of rain are really um, important. So if you've had um, more than two days um, of rain, then the animals will be getting tired. And if it's not looking like um, there's an improvement in the weather, then we need to be thinking about um, implementing our contingency plan. And we can link that with the proportion of the paddock that's got water pooling. So from our study, when we had more than 17% of the area um, had pooling, then the average lying time was less than 10 hours a day. And when it was more than 80%, the average lying time was less than eight hours a day. So a couple of, um, I guess, things that you can be looking at within your, your paddocks as to um, where things are at with those animals achieving their lying times. Next slide, thank you. So we've heard a little bit about um, some of the contingency plans that are used by others from Olivia, but just probably ticking off a few more. So we've talked about the feed budgeting, um, increasing the area available. So that can either be um, providing a second break of crop in the day, providing it's safe to do so. So um, with fodder beet, that might not be the case because we might um, push them into a a area where we've got um, nutritional challenges or alternatively if we've gone through a period of um, fine weather and you've actually got good conditions behind the back fence is just maybe um, taking that back a bit so that you've got um, the cows have got more area to find those good lying spots. Uh, we've talked about saving the drier lower risk crop paddocks um, and particularly any that have got shelter. Um, in the plan that Olivia showed um, they'd fenced off an area, in a sheltered area in the paddock and they to go back to when um, the events occurred. Um, there's opportunities in terms of yards and laneways for short periods or, and if you're, I guess if you've got feed pads, standoff pads or carving pads, being able to utilise them. Um, one of the things that we're seeing uh, down in Southland, uh, farmer put in last year was uh, a grass strip uh, in his fodder beet paddock and you can see um, in that uh, photo at the bottom. Basically, that's sort of the breakout area. So when it was really wet, was able to open up the fence into that grass area. So increased the um, area available to them, but also a different surface for them to be lying on. And then um, there are farmers that are also using tree blocks, but we need to make sure that they're trees that are not gonna cause any issues with um, pregnancies. 
Thanks, Maria. So just going to move now um, and do a bit of a summary in terms of catch crops. So this is um, research that's been done by Plant and Food Research, and they've had a program of work uh, looking at this across um, several regions of the country. So the principles around the catch crops, uh, as Tom said earlier, is one of them's around mopping up the nitrogen that's in the urine patches. And the second one is that they can they reduce drainage because we've got a plant growing there that's gonna be utilizing some of that, that moisture. So in terms of the key principles with catch crops, um, sowing them as early as possible, using a winter active species. So oats is better than triticale, which is better than Italian ryegrass. They all have benefits. Um, targeting minimum or no tillage, uh, but the key is to make sure that you do, um, whatever you do, you have as best as possible um, seed soil contact to get good germination. Um, targeting high plant populations and minimising weed competition so that you get those plants really going well. Uh, in terms of nitrogen fertiliser, really not required um, in the initial stages, in some areas they may be required um, after October, but because there's so much nitrogen in the soil, not required at the um, establishment. And then from the work that they've done, harvesting at that green chop silage or the booting stage um, provides the maximum yield and quality. And so there's um, on the Dairy NZ and the FAR websites, there's some more guidelines around catch crops. Thanks, Maria. So. Although it's not a silver bullet, um, it is another um, tool in the toolbox. We know that there are limitations to catch crops. Um, so the paddock gets too wet and you can't get on it. So uh, that, yeah, and it's, it's not dry enough um, until it's too late to get it in. Uh, where you're cropping on um, a milking platform, it might not fit in with the rotation because trying to get those paddocks back into grass as soon as possible, but an oats and Italian mix may help uh, here. Uh, if anybody is doing a fodder beet, fodder beet rotation, again, um, we're wanting to try and maximise um, our, we won't be able to maximise catch crop production because we need to get the, the um, next fodder beet crop in at an optimal time. Uh, for those of you that are in um, areas that are dry land areas or where water is limiting, um, the catch crops may actually deplete that soil moisture, so um, could impact on the success of the, the main crop that's following that. Uh, the other thing is in terms of when the feed supply comes in, it's not necessarily at the right time that you need it, so we need to conserve that which will add cost. And um, there have been some issues in terms of getting the right seed. So again, not a silver bullet, but definitely something that we need to consider um, in our planning. Thanks, Maria. So just a couple of um, slides to finish off around um, some work that's just starting up. So uh, through Thriving Southland, the Macquarie Hedge Hope Catchment Group um, have got a pilot demonstration looking at different crop establishments. And this sort of came out of the work that we did at the Southern Dairy Hub last year. So um, can we get, provide better conditions and have the soils hold up better if we use a different cultivation technique? So um, we've got the two, a couple of paddocks at the Southern Dairy Hub and then have teamed up with 11 commercial farms in Southland that have put crops in in different ways. And we'll be monitoring um, some soil soil conditions, yields, costs, all of those sorts of things over the next uh, few months just to see what happens. And if it looks like it's successful, uh, then we'll look at um, a more uh, targeted um, research uh, in coming, coming years. Thanks, Maria. And another um, study that's being run um, by Ag Research is repeating the work that Tom talked about at Telford uh, with the protection of the critical source areas, but doing it with sheep grazing. So it's really around under understanding the impacts of the sheep grazing on those soil physical properties and contaminant runoff. So it's a three year study, um, just about to go into the second year. Uh, so watch this space and um, hopefully by the end of next winter, there'll be some really good information in terms of the value of protecting the critical source areas um, under sheep grazing systems. Next slide, thank you. So just to finish off, um, as uh, the sectors, the agricultural sectors, we've got one opportunity to get crop wintering right, and it's this winter. Thank you. <laughs>